This, y'all, this is a strange morning for me. <laughs> a sorrowful morning, um, a uh, beautiful morning. <laughs> hey? Okay. Yeah. We came out of the 8 o'clock service and there were two, two fawns in the yard. Yeah, I couldn't have been more than a day or two old joining the congregation. A, a beautiful morning. I, um, I was not on any social media at all yesterday, and so I woke up um, and saw that my son had sent a text and um, that there had been an attempt to assassinate uh, former President Trump yesterday. Um, I'm going to talk about shaking <laughs> in a little bit, but I was shaken this morning at the at the news, um, and I thought we just don't know what's going to happen when we wake up, if we wake up, <laughs> on any given day, you can go to sleep, and the world could be a very different place at any moment. That shook me. So I'd like to start with a prayer for former President Trump. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord, we are deeply shocked by news reports of the assassination attempt on the life of former President Trump. We praise you that he seems to be okay. Please heal Mr. Trump in the days ahead in body, mind, and spirit. We are grateful for the swift actions of the Secret Service and local first responders. We pray for those who died, or were injured yesterday at the rally. We pray for the health and safety of all, for healing and peace, and for an end to violence in our nation and in the world. May God guide and protect us all through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you. Um, I've got, uh, I mean, this sermon was done days ago. And I woke up at 4 o'clock this morning, and uh, I wouldn't have gotten out of bed except I saw the text from my son. I thought, well, I better look at these. And um, so I started over. <laughs> no, not quite. I <laughs> just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that part of this morning, uh, that gospel that I just read, and all that's happening for you all as a parish family is also wrapped up in what happened yesterday. And I thought um, of you... Uh, of course, this morning, I've been thinking and praying for you all week, um, well, weeks, <laughs> um, and um, I thought of, uh, if you'll take out your prayer book and turn to page 833, I thought of, you know, in the, in the days ahead, whatever those will bring, and as we know, we don't know what they'll bring the days ahead, um, uh, I thought of... Uh, you, the people, the body of Christ here at St. Luke's, and I thought that this prayer that uh, St. Francis wrote, um, really, uh, if any congregation lives out the mission statement of this prayer, you all do. And, and, and that's the right next thing to do. <laughs> uh, no matter what we face in life, uh, this, is, this is the next right thing to do. And I commend you for embodying this prayer. Will you pray with me? Are you with me? Okay, here we go. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is discord, union. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy, grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we pardon, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. 
Well, it's that work I really was prepared to speak about and want to talk to you about today, that work that you all have, and that's before you right now. Um, I worked on this sermon um, on my back deck. Uh, I have a lovely back deck. It overlooks, uh, it's kind of high up, uh, it's a, my house is built on a hill, and so when I look out of my top deck, I see trees, I'm in trees. Uh, they're all around us. Uh, we, the children named our house uh, Nature Roof. <laughs> and it kind of feels like that, like your Robinson Crusoe or something, or the Swiss Family Robinson, that's, that's what I meant. Uh, we live, uh, that's what it looks like, it's very peaceful. Uh, and I remember especially that Thursday morning, how cool it was. Do you remember that? Oh my gosh, I thought, oh, there's coolness still in the high country. <laughs> birds singing, our own deer moving through the yard and other woodland creatures. And I thought, don't we hope something like that for Cindy? <laughs> With you, and I got to be here uh, a Saturday night before her last Sunday, and that was a joy uh, to be with you and to appreciate uh, you and Cindy. Um, I. I am so grateful for Cindy's ministry uh, among us. Um, She was, is an invaluable, sane, seasoned, and joyful voice for me. (laughs) I was rector at St. Mary of the Hills for 22 years, and for most of that time, Cindy, uh, much of that time, Cindy was the rector here. And so we were colleagues and got together uh, on a regular basis uh, for counsel and for uh, mutual uh, support, and uh, uh, I'll be so grateful. We began over the years to develop a back deck theology. (laughs) And that was, if you're having trouble, (laughs) get to your back deck. (laughs) Not bad, huh? (laughs) I hope everybody has a place like that, if not a back deck. a wonderful place that's cool and connects you with creation and sort of helps put things in uh, perspective. Uh, May Cindy live into the adventure of uh, whatever's next for her in retirement day by day. Uh, And there was one sense uh, in which I was so sorry that the gospel today was that tragic, horrible story. I mean, how many times? It doesn't happen so poignantly, but there are times in our liturgical life where I say the good news of the Lord and we have to say praise to you Lord Christ or thanks thanks be to God and and I know we're scratching our head and saying what (laughs) it's a it's a terrible story Uh, and uh, of course it's a it's a dramatic um, um, living out of the brokenness of the world in so many different ways Um, but bringing John to mind in another way, John the Baptist, for me, just fit perfectly. Um, John's whole life is, was summed up by him. And it was summed up uh, when he said of Jesus, speaking about himself and Jesus, he said, he must increase. I must decrease. John the Baptist said that. He must increase, I must decrease. You know that. Um, The story uh, that we just read is really, in some ways, you know, the final, uh, in this world, the final act of his decrease in order that Jesus may increase. Uh, He said that when a group of people came to him and they uh, were kind of... uh, worried that John's followers were all going to Jesus. So John's congregation was getting smaller and Jesus's were getting bigger. And normally pastors don't want to hear that about anybody. (laughs) They said, Rabbi, he who is with you beyond the Jordan to whom you bore witness, here he is baptizing and all are going to him. John answered, you yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. 
the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now full. He must increase, but I must decrease. He connects that with his deepest joy. John does. So whatever Herod and all those actors were thinking, that moment was part of John's deepest joy. And no amount of brokenness in the world could change that or conquer that or move uh, John away from that. Those particular words were so important to me when I was getting ready to leave and then left St. Mary of the Hills after 22 years. That happened seven years ago. I'm like an old retired guy now. <laughs> seven years. I had to decrease and watch that happen. And uh, in, in so many ways, as I'm sure Cindy did, and all of us have in, in different ways, but uh, I, the, the one, one moment it was especially true is a vestry meeting was called, and, and I was, as the rector, the chair of the vestry, so I'm chairing the meeting, but part of that meeting was um, uh, Augusta Anderson, the canon to the ordinary, came to give, give an idea of what's to come, and, and when her tank time came to speak, she said, Rick, you can go. <laughs> go where? <laughs> Anywhere, out of here. <laughs> oh, it's just so true. Uh, I had to decrease. It was, it was necessary for the life of St. Mary of the Hills. And so now perhaps it's important for you. Cindy must decrease and you and Jesus must increase. The transition has begun. So this is when we learn, all of us perhaps, it never really was about us, <laughs> but priests especially learn that. It's about the mystery of God, the good news of the gospel, the power of the Holy Spirit. We knew it all along, but times like these, we live it. So there's changes ahead. As you let your previous rector go, find an interim, begin discernment about your future, and someday finally call a new person to serve as rector of St. Luke's. So I thought of this time as a shaking, a shaking. Um, and I thought of St. Paul, uh, St. Paul's letter to the Hebrews. He talks about how everything has to be shaken, everything. All of us and everything have to be shaken. He talks about that uh, in that wonderful chapter where he says, um, uh, the great cloud of witnesses that surrounds us, that wonderful verse where he's talking about the great heroes of the faith and heroines, and says they're all around us. And he's trying to strengthen the congregation he's writing to. And, but he says, but it's going to be hard because everything's got to be shaken. He says, um, God spoke to Israel on Sinai, and the voice was frightening, and it shook everything. He says, yet once more, God said, I will shake not only the earth, but the heavens. Yet once more, Paul says, indicates the removal of what is shaken in order that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship. So I'd like to move to that now, that we are shaken, you are being shaken, everything is being shaken, and yet it's so that something that cannot be shaken remains. It's almost like sifting wheat or something and then having what is uh, worth keeping and goes on no matter what. Um, St. Luke's has begun shaking. <laughs> um, so I'd like to talk about what cannot be shaken uh, in one sense, that's really going to be your work in the, in the weeks and months to come, is to say what that is for you as a parish family, as the people of God here. Who has called you to be at St. Luke's, whoever the rector of the parish is? What is the heart of your witness to Christ? And how will that be communicated 
to other people so they can catch that essence of what it means to be a follower of Christ here at St. Luke's. That's doubtless going to, be a, going to be a manifold and wonderful vision, but it is getting to the heart of what can't be shaken about you in this place. So I'd like to give you what I think is one thing for all of us that cannot be shaken. It comes to us from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. It's right at the beginning of that letter, a strange verse. Paul said, blessed be God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy, blameless, and before him in love. And the phrase I love in this is from before the foundation of the world. We were before God in love. I just think that's super cool. <laughs> before the foundation of the world, our life in Christ is forever in every direction to the beginning and before and to the end and beyond. In before him in love, Paul says. One poet uh, dealing with this section, this verse, sa said it this way, uh, before nothing burst into everything, you were wanted. Before stars were flung like seeds into motion, you were loved. Before the worm tore Eden or the sun left his throne, you were chosen. And as age after almost endless age gathered planets, raised and lowered mountains, filled and emptied oceans, brought life, then more life into being, God held you in thought, in heart, in hand. And so it will be forever. Before the foundation of the world. That phrase happens five times in the New Testament. I won't tell you about all five. <laughs> so it's something that other New Testament writers are wondering about and thinking about and imagining in their life, our life in Christ, that from the bef before, the beginning of all this and everything that led to this, we were held and loved and wanted and chosen and before God in love. That perfect love which casts out fear, which is the greatest of all things, which endures all things, believes all things, was already accomplished forever in the love of the Holy Trinity for us and for all. This is for sure. This cannot be shaken. Or maybe rather, after all the shaking is over, <laughs> this was true, this is true, and this will be true. You are loved, cherished, cherished, wanted from before the foundation of the world. And I think it's from this eternal home in the very heart of God's infinite eternal love that we can go forward into whatever it is we need to be about. That we can face whatever political situation, environmental situation, family situation, personal situation comes into our life from this eternal home in the very heart of God's eternal triune love, we can go forward. You can do this as St. Luke's Episcopal Church. And each of us individually can do this because each of us has our own uh, story of being shaken. Uh, we bring things here today that we may not talk about and maybe shouldn't talk about that have shaken us. It could be something I mentioned, it could be something else. Each of us can live from a God who has wanted us from before the worlds began. We need deep wells of love, forgiveness, resiliency, persistence, and that is just what we have from God. 
So I'd like to share one little shaking, and then I'll be done. <laughs> Personal shaking. My daughter is due. <laughs> Five days from now is her due date. My baby is having a baby. <laughs> That's impossible, I want you all to know. <laughs> it can't happen, but it is. <laughs> Everything's going great. Uh, we're so delighted. Uh, but it has uh, filled me with um, both excitement and some fear. Her name, uh, it's a girl. Her name is McLean. Uh, McLean is my mother's maiden name. <laughs> is that sweet? Um, and um, will she be okay? <laughs> will Megan be okay? Will she get, McLean, will she get what she needs to thrive? Will the things her body needs, her mind, her heart, her spirit, will she receive what she needs? What will the world be like that she's coming into? Will she be okay? So this coming of this baby has opened up in me uh, a need to pray because I need, what was that list I said? Love, <laughs> forgiveness, persistence, resiliency, <laughs> hope. I need all of that and bucket loads of it. And that's what I can get. That's what I get in in this God who has all of that and has had all of that for me, for Megan, for McLean, for you, and on and on that goes from before the foundation of the world. So I'm praying a lot, ask your prayers for Megan, um, and uh, I'm praying for the thriving, I'm praying uh, for everything that they'll need for life and salvation. And I've been praying this. Um, my other granddaughter was born just a year ago. That's a great joy. And she, we baptized her. Was that me? <laughs> Lord, I'm ready. <laughs> uh, I really liked the baptism. <laughs> it was a high point in my spiritual life to see uh, Lainey, my son's daughter, baptized. And so I'm praying that McLean will be brought safely to the waters of baptism. So I'd like to end with prayer, if you'll take out your prayer book and turn to page 829. And this is a prayer for young persons, but it's really for all of us. All of us are children of God. All of us um, stay in that relationship. We, we grow up, we might be grown children of God, but that's what we are, uh, children of God. And so this is a prayer for, for all of us. Some of it fits real well, and some of it just uh, doesn't. <laughs> but I, I want to pray. So let's pray. Are you with me? 829 page uh, and uh, prayer number 47. Let us pray. God, our Father, you see your children growing up in an unsteady and confusing world. Show them that your ways give more life than the ways of the world and that following you is better than chasing after selfish goals. Help them take failure, not as a measure of their worth, but as a chance for a new start. Give them strength to hold their faith in you and keep alive their joy in your creation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.